Welcome to today's webinar, Walkability and Health, Building Strong, Vibrant, and Resilient Communities, Part 1, Tools and Techniques, hosted by the Maryland Department of Planning in association with the Smart Growth Network. My name is Michael Bayer. I am the Manager of Infrastructure and Development at the Maryland Department of Planning and Project Manager for the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse. The Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse is a project of the Smart Growth Network, supported by the US EPA's Office of Community Revitalization and managed by the Maryland Department of Planning. In addition to hosting webinars, the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse has a website, smartgrowth.org, that provides current information on effective growth, development, and preservation practices. The website provides news and information about events, funding opportunities, awards, and resources to help local decision makers foster healthy, resilient, and economically vibrant communities. The Clearinghouse is also the virtual home of the Smart Growth Network, a nationally recognized coalition of leadership organizations that have formally endorsed the principles of Smart Growth. This webinar is one in a series of webinars produced by the Maryland Department of Planning on Smart Growth and Planning topics available for viewing at smartgrowth.org. We are recording this webinar and will post it on our website early next week under the Webinar Archives tab. We encourage you to visit the website and subscribe to our e-newsletter to get smart growth news and information and to learn about our upcoming webinars. You can also learn about planning initiatives, planning tools, and educational opportunities in Maryland by visiting the Maryland Department of Planning's website at planning.maryland.gov. The views expressed by speakers in this webinar are those of the speakers and not necessarily of the Maryland Department of Planning or the State of Maryland. Viewers of this live event are eligible to receive one and a half CM credits from the American Planning Association and 1.5 CNUA, CEU, self-reported credits from the Congress for the New Urbanism. To log your AICP credits, visit the American Planning Association's website at planning.org, log, log into your account and search for the name of today's event, which is Walkability and Health, Building Strong, Vibrant and Resilient Communities. You can also search for event number 9201387. So to get started, our speakers today are Dan Burden and Mark Fenton. Dan Burden, the Director of Innovation and Inspiration for Blue Zones LLC, has focused his entire career on helping the world get back on its feet. In 1980, Dan created the Walking Audit, a highly interactive way to help people see their community through a sharper, more people-focused lens. The concept is now taught in many universities. By inspiring residents, policymakers, planners, and designers to change their built, built environments to accommodate people and not just cars, Dan has helped more than 3,800 communities take steps to become more walkable and livable. During walking audits, Dan illustrates the benefits of sometimes simple and often difficult changes and provides a roadmap for people to create neighborhoods, streets, intersections, and cities that are more healthy and better connected. Mark Fenton is a nationally recognized public health planning and transportation consultant and a built environment expert with the Blue Zones team. He's an adjunct associate professor at Tufts University's Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy and has hosted the series America's Walking on PBS television. He has consulted with the University of North Carolina's National Center for Smart Routes, Safe Routes to School and the Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center, and has led training and planning processes for pedestrian, bicycle, and transit-friendly designs in communities across the US, Canada, and Australia. Mark studied engineering and biomechanics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He was the manager of the Human Performance Laboratory at Reebok and has published numerous articles and books related to exercise science, physical activity promotion, and the need for community, environmental, and public policy interventions to increase active transportation. He also likes to practice what he preaches, having served on and chairing his community's planning board and walking and cycling for as many routine trips as possible. Following their presentations, Dan and Mark will answer as many questions as time permits you can uh, submit a question anytime during their presentations by using the questions tool in the control panel located on the right side of your screen. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark. Welcome, Mark. 
Well, thank you so much, uh, Michael. It's really a pleasure to uh, be with you and a privilege to join you. And I'll, I want to thank you and your colleague, John Coleman, who's been so instrumental in the uh, uh, bringing us to this moment. It's a real privilege to be here and, uh, and to join my colleague and longtime friend, Dan Burden. Uh, Dan, uh, Danielle Schaefner and I make up the built environment team for Blue Zones. So Dan Burden there on the left, he's the director of inspiration and innovation, which I think is one of the coolest titles you could possibly have. Uh, Danielle, who is not with us today, but will join us in part two in two weeks when we continue this webinar. Uh, uh, she's the director of projects and planning and was formerly an, uh, is an epidemiologist by training and formerly with the Department of Health in Hawaii. So we got to work with her there. And then I am an engineer by background, live in the Boston area. Um, and it's interesting because I think those different disciplines that we come from reflect the need for interdisciplinary work in this field. Um, you'll also notice that uh, they both um, sort of, one of the reasons they're on the team is because their names both start with Dan. It turns out that that's one of the criteria for working with the Blue Zones Built Environment team. Uh, this is in fact the founder of Blue Zones, Dan Butner, uh, and Dan uh, is, probably known to many of you because he's somewhat famous for his exploration of those places in the world uh, where people tend to, uh, there's a high proportion of people that live to the age of 100 and beyond. And he designated those blue zones. They called them that in the original National Geographic article that he wrote about this and the many books he's written since. Um, and what's striking about his findings in this exploration, he was a National Geographic explorer, in fact, when he did this, was that, um, these people did not eat anything uniquely special, a special pill. It's not like they had particularly good health care. What they did was they lived a lifestyle um, that kept them socially engaged, where they had a sense of purpose and a great purpose and, and access to lots of community engagement. Uh, they ate a healthy and balanced diet, so they had access to healthy food, and they were physically active. And to be crystal clear, they were not exercisers, but they were active as part of daily life. They gardened, they walked, they took care of great-grandchildren. Uh, they were actively engaged and still volunteering in their community and could get to those things. Um, and one of the big takeaways, and which was really the foundational to the creation of the Blue Zones organization, was this understanding that the environment plays a huge influence there. In other words, your genetics is a certain portion of your health destiny and your access to health care. But the reality is the environment you live in and how it alters your behaviors, affects your behaviors, is hugely influential in, in your long-term health outcomes. Uh, so that's uh, why we at the Built Environment team so very, very lucky because we believe the built environment is sort of central to long, productive, and healthy lives, and the evidence really, really supports that idea. And I know many people on this call believe that because that's and that's one of the reasons you, you work in this area. Now, lacking the Dan first name, the reason, thankfully, I was able to get on the team was by virtue of the other selection criteria, was which was copious facial hair. Uh, because I, I, I passed the, the mustache test for Dan Burden, uh, I was allowed onto the built environment team, and I'm, I'm really honored to say I've actually been working with Dan for uh, for several decades now. We were realizing it's probably 25 years. Um, I really consider him one of my mentors. He certainly taught me about walk audits. Um, and Dan and I have been doing walk audits and bicycle audits and transit audits with communities all over the country and in fact around the world. Um, it's been an extraordinary adventure and that's why it's, it's such a treat to be with him here today. Um, and, and what I'd like to do is kind of summarize for you where we're gonna go and I hope you'll join us for the second part as well of, of this webinar, because today I'm going to talk for a few minutes about the health connection, why we believe health agencies uh, and, uh, should, uh, and partners are integral to building good interdisciplinary teams and where the call to make changes to the built environment for smart growth, for more walkable, bikeable places, is so critical. We'll talk a little about the fundamentals of walk audits. Dan will kind of set up how we set them up and what we're looking for, setting a route, who you invite. He'll start talking a little about what we audit when we're actually out there and he'll start with sidewalks today. And then the remaining kind of technical topics will come up in our next uh, webinar, and then we'll conclude that webinar with some of the big lessons we've learned doing these many over the years and some implementation tips. So uh, really the two parts go hand in hand here as we set it up. And I've got to start with the bad news first, actually. Um, and this is news you are all well aware of, and it has much to do with sort of what we're, what we're experiencing right now. Um, for something like 30 years, uh, and, and for Dan, more like 35, 40, uh, we've been trying to encourage people to drive less and to walk and to bike and take transit more, to shift modes, to get out of their cars, to be 
physically active in their travel for all the benefits, health benefits, environmental benefits, congestion benefits, local economic benefits, right? We've done walk audits across the country in conditions of, of wide variety. 30 years we've been trying to do this, and I'm going to suggest that it's been largely to no avail. And, and that's, by the way, a lot of you on this call have been doing this very good work, too. Um, but here's Gail Kamal's travel sort of over in the U.S. over the last several decades, and it's been rising inexorably with a tiny little blip there at about the uh, 2008 recession, um, which many of us hoped might become a plateau, but then, boy, coming out of the recession, it looked like, oh, no, VMT is going to continue to go up until after 30 years of trying to encourage people to walk and bike more and drive less, uh, the coronavirus and, and, uh, pandemic did it in three months. Dramatic drop off in vehicle miles traveled with a whole host of commensurate changes. Um, I'm not suggesting that in any way we would have wanted this. Um, it's a horrible, horrible uh, impact on society at large. Um, but there may be a lesson to be taken from this. Um, we see major roadways, you know, sort of city paper after city newspaper has reported on their empty highways with tremendous ramifications, reductions in congestion, uh, dramatic increases in air quality. The picture on the right from NASA shows nox uh, um, nitrous oxides. Um, and you can look from Detroit through Cleveland, uh, Pittsburgh, all of the eastern seaboard, D.C. To, to Boston, these dramatic reductions comparing um, air quality in, in March of 2020 versus the four or five years preceding. Um, it's just amazing to think about the scale of the change here. Um, and uh, on, a, on a more micro scale, I, I, many of us are observing lots of people out walking, people uh, walking as family units, in fact, um, um, people demanding more space for walking and bicycling. We know many cities have actually reallocated space. They're doing open streets and street closures and uh, taking motor vehicle lanes and converting them to temporary bicycle or widened sidewalks. Um, and the Beltline Trail in Atlanta, uh, where there's such demand for people to get out, they've actually built an entire campaign around reminding people people uh, to maintain safe social distancing because we know it's critically important. We know it's very beneficial to be physically active, but also critically important to maintain safe so social distancing. We know that there's been a lot of demand. People have been thinking about um, the land use in their communities in, in, in the regards that they're thinking, God, I wish I had a nearby pharmacy, grocery store, uh, hardware store that were within walking distance um, rather than having to drive to a large retail center where possibly the, the sharing of, of you know, um, uh, the virus could be at a higher level. So we're seeing some elements of this pandemic peel apart layers of the onion that get people thinking about things that many of us have been working on for decades. Um, uh, and obviously, we can't talk about what's actually happening in this country right now with recognizing the monstrous upheaval. Uh, uh, regarding race and racism and uh, the, the, the tremendous awareness and discussion that's happening. Um, I've got to thank my daughter and her girlfriend for these photos. They were at the, this, this march in Washington this weekend to uh, newly named Black Lives Matter Plaza. Um, this is uh, a, a moment of reckoning in this country, I believe. Long, long, long overdue and coming. Um, but interestingly enough, um, also related to the work in our discipline, I think many of us would suggest and believe sincerely that those that work and have worked in planning and in transportation for decades um, would acknowledge um, explicit as well as implicit failures regarding race and equity, whether it's things like redlining and, and you know, sort of um, redlining around mortgages and redlining districts in around race and housing, whether it's the de facto segregation of schools by how we draw district lines, uh, the, the frequent placement of large highway projects in the most disenfranchised neighborhoods, usually minority neighborhoods and urban centers, uh, by virtue of them having the least political power. Um, uh, um, and even at the micro level, I would suggest things like when I host a walk audit, how inclusive, how successfully have I been inclusive in engaging the residents of the very community where we're doing the workshop, the walk audit. So the scale is from the massive project and zoning scale right on down to the the, the micro scale of our day-to-day our -day interactions as planners, as transportation engineers, as public health agents, um, as elected officials and community leaders. Um, this is a moment of reckoning and we need to take all of this into account. And I would suggest on, on, the, on the positive side that walk audits are one of the tools um, that might uh, open the door to uh, our better engagement around these topics. That said, um, I'm gonna give you a little quiz right now. We're gonna do a poll. And, and what we're gonna ask you to do is look at these five 
causes of death. So these are causes of premature death. And I want you to pick the one that you think is the, gonna have the highest number of deaths associated with that cause this year, in the year 2020. Okay, so they, it's open on everybody's screen. And if you're having trouble with the polling, you may need to exit from full screen mode. But the five options here, like most likely cause of death for the greatest number of premature deaths this year, COVID-19, motor vehicle collisions, opioid abuse and overdose, physical inactivity or poor nutrition and pedestrian fatalities. And we'll close the poll in a couple of seconds as people respond here. So go ahead and just pick the one and then uh, we'll, we'll take a look at your answers. Um, and I give this quiz to widely variant audiences, public at large, public health professionals, who as you can imagine, tend to do pretty well on it. Uh, although you'd be surprised, depending on one's perspective, uh, you get uh, surprisingly different answers. Um, so I think Michael in a moment here. So we're seeing um, over half of you, good, good. I'm glad to see that over half of you are picking physical inactivity and poor nutrition. Um, and um, we're, uh, that second highest is motor vehicle collisions. That's very interesting. And then lower numbers for the other three choices here. Well, excellent, Michael. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, so you guys did well on the quiz, actually. Um, and I'm gonna actually show you a little more data than just those five causes. Um, Cause I wanna make an important point here. Uh, as those of you that work in transportation and traffic safety, I'm sure you know that pedestrian collision is something that we lose about five to 6,000 pedestrians a year or have in recent years. And that number has trended up recently, very disconcertingly. Then you'll notice that three of the causes here fall in the tens of thousands. Seasonal flu annually takes uh, uh, something like 30 to 50,000 Americans. Motor vehicle collisions, similar kind of number. Opioid overdose, um, something closer to 60 or 70,000. The coronavirus, obviously, we're only estimating. We hope that number won't far exceed 100,000, but it has already crested that level. Um, but notably, and the one that you properly picked, uh, what some people would call the obesity epidemic, which is better phrased as physical inactivity and poor nutrition, which combine as risk factors for obesity, something like 400,000 deaths in tobacco use, um, even exceeds that at 480,000, which explains why Blue Zones, you can imagine, is very focused on those three behavioral risk factors. Um, to put it in perspective, we will effectively shut down the economy for some several months or longer to, to try to hold at bay this infectious disease that will take 100 to 200,000 Americans prematurely. Horrible, and we hope that, that we have been effective in doing so. But every year we suffer closer to a million, certainly over 800,000 deaths due to essentially three behavioral risk factors, physical inactivity, poor nutrition, and tobacco use. And we know that access is often one of the problems around poor nutrition. That is living in a neighborhood where one doesn't have access to healthy food choices contributes to poor nutrition. So those of us at Blue Zones, and I work with the Centers for Disease Control a lot around this, but there's great recognition that the built environment is a strong influencer on these three risk factors that take so many American lives prematurely every single year. It's a sort of an ongoing pandemic. Um, here's the other news. As little as 30 minutes a day or averaging about 150 minutes a week of moderate physical activity. So we're not talking exercise, go to the gym. We're saying walk to the corner store, bike to work, um, walk as part of your trip to transit every day. If you could average 30 minutes, you'll reduce your risk for cardiovascular disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, obesity, dementia in old age, osteoporosis, a growing list of cancers. Um, moderate daily phys physical activity has tremendous protective effects. Um, further, we are realizing now that the heavy burden of, of severe uh, COVID-19 cases and deaths seem to be associated with comorbidities. That is, the very uh, pre-existing conditions I've just alluded to, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease, put you at much greater risk of death. And one last point. Um, it is very clear that the burdens of both chronic disease and this infectious disease pandemic are falling very disproportionately on people of color in the United States. I wanna be crystal clear about this. Dr. Michelle Evans in the National Institute of Health, the New England Journal of Medicine just published an amazing interview with her um, that sort of lays out the evidence around this. And it is both uh, stunningly powerful and heartbreaking uh, to hear the data that she can recite. So I, I call that to your attention and, and urge you to go listen to that. It's at the New England Journal of Medicine website. I ju it just published, it's just out. So I didn't even make a slide about it. Um, but her discussion of um, this disproportionate burden and how it is falling on minority populations, and in particular, uh, Black Americans, is just, just heartbreaking. So having said all that, I, I hope that we have reminded ourselves of the extraordinarily important case 
for building environments where people can get physical activity as a routine part of their daily life. And if we're going to do things like walk audits, we've got to do this in a way that the vast majority of Americans under, can understand. In other words, you, you can't have to be a, a transportation planner, an architect, an engineer uh, uh, by, by training. This has got to be the kind of stuff that the average American can both learn about, participate in the conversation, and help change their community. So I often simplify the story about active transportation, walking, bicycling, and transit to, to the four main elements that come out of the research in this field, uh, which you see here. Uh, we tend to see, if you read the research literature, four things come up again and again as characterizing settings where people walk, bike, and take transit more often. And they are the mix of destinations. You know, land use planners always talk about mix of land uses, having where we live and work and shop and play and learn and play more in proximity, more intermingled than segregated by use. Um, these photos, by the way, a lot of these photos come from uh, Barry County, Michigan, which is one of the communities that we in Blue Zones are working in right now. Uh, second would be a connected network of facilities for the active mode, right? A good and comprehensive network. You can't have just a piece of bike trail here and a piece of bike lane over there, but a connected network that lets us connect those different kinds of destinations. Comprehensive sidewalks inter integrated intermodally with transit. Third, when you get to a destination, it has to reward you rather than punish you for uh, showing up without a car. Um, it's got to essentially be built in a way that you're, you're, you, you feel like you're supposed to be there as a pedestrian on bike, uh, uh, hopping off the bus. Us. Um, and last but not least, it's got to be safe and accessible for everybody. It's got to work for people of all ages, all incomes, all abilities, all races. And when we fail on that, then we really have not completed the network at all, have we? Um, and one of the reasons I, I on walk audits will often take uh, the participants, in these case elected officials, I think in Mansfield, Connecticut, um, where we see the desire line here, what some would call the goat trail worn next to the road. Because what we know is if you drive by that, you can drive by that, in fact, every day at 35, 45 miles an hour and not really realize it's there. You walk it, you're going to remember that the sidewalk is incomplete here, that, that, that there is a, a gap in the sidewalk network. So um, that speaks to why we believe uh, real physical engagement in the space is so important, why we think walk audits are such a useful tool. So um, that's really the setup. I just want to make one more point, um, that your public health community is on board with this. They've heard this message, and they are ready partners. So if you work in planning or public works, uh, engineering, um, uh, economic development, housing, transit, and you have not yet connected with your health partners, then you should. In 2015, the Surgeon General of the United States published a document called the Surgeon General's Call to Action to Promote Walking and Walkable Communities. It basically said we can't just tell people to go walk and get their 30 minutes per day if it's not safe enough for them to do so. We have to build inviting spa spaces for them to go do it every day as part of their walking a child to school, riding their bike for errands, hopping on transit for work. And indeed, uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Health and Human Services have launched a national campaign called Active People, Healthy Nation about increasing physical activity at the population level. And a fundamental tenet of that, I am taking the language directly from that campaign, is active routes to everyday destinations. Now, if that's not something that we all on this call that care about smart growth are talking about all the time, then I don't know what is. What we want is people to be able to choose the active travel option to their everyday needs, right? So public health is with us, and we should be reaching out to them at, at the state level, state health departments, regional, local level, um, their natural partners. And I'll say one last point. They're good conveners. So when it is time to, for example, organize your walk audit, the public health folks can actually be some of the very, very best partners in getting that uh, people to attend the walk audit and participate. Um, so with that, I'm going to take a breath. Uh, I'm going to thank you again for your attention and the opportunity to join you. I'll look forward to speaking to you during the rest of the webinar and next week or in two weeks. Uh, and I'm going to hand it over to Dan to talk a little more about how we actually apply walk audits. So I think he'll be he'll be taking control of the stream in a moment. Mark. And uh, right, Mark yeah. and I uh, share. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Can folks hear my voice? My voice. You're good, Dan. Thank you. So we're gonna yep. pause. Okay. You're on. Okay. No, so you're is good. My screen now up. Applying walking audits. Yes, it is. Thanks, Dan. Go ahead. Oh, OK, so the screen is good. Good. I want to uh, first of all thank. Uh, you guys can't hear me. We can hear you, Hello? Dan. Go ahead. 
Go ahead, Dan. OK, and you can see the screen too, correct? Yes, we're you're here. good. Go on, go so, forward. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Mark for. Uh, well, I'm not. Uh, you evidently you can't hear me. Is that right? No, we can. Go ahead, Dan, please. Okay, so I'm going to assume you can hear me, uh, even, even though it doesn't yeah, sound like on. you it's, can. It's all good, buddy. And uh, I want to first of all thank yeah. Mark for sending such a beautiful. We can hear you, Dan. Just go ahead. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's going on because I'm uh, asking and. Uh, you can't hear me? Dan, you're good. Please go Hello? ahead. We can hear you. <laughs> and you're fine. OK, so uh, I want to first of all thank. Well, <laughs> no, it's not working because you're you, you say it's working, but you're not able to hear me. We can, we can hear you, Dan. Just go forward. Don't Howdy. just don't worry about it. Just move it, move on. Okay, I'm going to assume you can hear me. So, uh, again, I'd like yeah, to thank you for the chat for box. That, that was a, an old message. A you're proper good stage. You're good on the help impact. Okay, you can hear me though, right? Okay. Uh, I want to read a quote I just came across yesterday from Dick Jackson, one of the, the great pioneers and leaders in uh, this entire field. He basically says that public health planning and architecture have been married for a long time, which is true. Uh, but we've just gone through a difficult divorce called the 20th century. And so one hopeful outcome of the work we're preparing to do now is that we're going to come out of a divorce and truly uh, have the health community be a whole partner in what we achieve to do. So I'm going to uh, move into the presentation mode and see if I can change the slides. And I'm assuming that you can now see the, the slide deck that's up in front of you. As uh, Mark indicated, he and I both have been doing walking audits for yep. well, quite a while. My first walking audit was in the 1980s after I realized that the Florida DOT, uh, where I was working, that the, many of the staff engineers had never walked the intersections that they had designed. So I asked them what it was like to walk around the intersection and said, we don't walk around the intersections. So <laughs> that was the birth of the first walking audit. The, rest of the afternoon, uh, we went out in the field and figured out uh, how differently they would design if they would walk around and put themselves into the shoes of the pedestrian. There are many reasons why we do walking audits. The big one is to gain that common knowledge and common ground among elected leaders, staff, uh, the people who live in the neighborhoods, uh, it helps us gain the stakeholder support. Uh, and it's amazing things you could talk through inside of a, a meeting room, which, which just seemed to bounce off uh, those ideas like rainwater on a raincoat. All of a sudden, uh, people are starting to realize what you're really talking about because they're experiencing it. And um, it does become the best way that we know how to train folks. So we often build them into any training course that we do. And uh, uh, also though to see what, not only what the motors and pedestrians are doing, but why they are. And we'll, we'll get into this in just a moment. But it is such a powerful tool that we cannot imagine uh, not doing walking audits on work we do in a, in a community. So paying attention to urban design, uh, one thing I'm hoping you're all seeing and picking up on it says to walk. There are sidewalks 
there are bike lanes. I hope you saw that immediately, but there's not a single person walking. So if you were to approach this intersection on this given day, a school day, you would sit there for close to 20 minutes because all we've done is built the environment for the success of the auto, and therefore we failed the auto. This happens to be the final approach to the high school in Maui. And you should be seeing uh, many dozens, if not hundreds of bicyclists and pedestrians, but we're not. I think everyone on this uh, presentation knows the big differences between walkability and in walkable in hospital uh, locations. But it's, it's more than just the pure physical environment it's really what we are trying to achieve. So notice in the more walkable environment here, it feels friendly, it feels welcoming, it feels comfortable. It feels safe because there are a lot of windows and eyes and there's a good buffer to the street. So uh, notice how those things are fully lacking in the scene of above, the non-walkable environment. So by the end of a walk, we're hopeful that folks in the group pick up on all these uh, kinds of details. But there are other reasons why the built environment has just abandoned uh, people. Notice the distinction. This is the same exact location in Grand Rapids uh, in 1910 in the year 2000 after the uh, divorce occurred between uh, architects and the uh, engineering community that, that uh, came alive at that time and then the uh, uh, a health community. Had, had we kept the health community, we would still see a lot of the qualities, the features that uh, induce uh, walking, transit, even bicycling. We also, before we do a walk, uh, like to really make sure people are, are uh, awakening their senses to what's missing. So I think anyone on this presentation uh, realizes this is uh, missing its sidewalks, even the crossing, so we can add those in. Uh, but then we say, well, this isn't enough. And then they recognize the green. But the big one, most people don't pick up on, and that is we need eyes on the street. We need a sense of enclosure. We need somewhere where if you allow your child to go down to the park and hang out, that you know they're going to be watched over by 16 or 20 or 40 houses. I want to talk. Uh, uh, very appropriately uh, uh, about inclusiveness. Uh, one of the walking audits, uh, it was a week long project we did in Columbus, Ohio. I photographed this sidewalk. You can see it has not been touched since it was built probably around 1910, 1920. Forcing the woman out into the street. And uh, at the conclusion of our work here, uh, we are going to take uh, lanes out of the street. We're going to make this back a two-way street, bring down the speeds. And uh, sadly, the project was killed, uh, uh, just shot down fully by the city traffic engineer at the time, because he said, well, this parallels Interstate 75, and, or, or I'm sorry, it's Interstate 71. And uh, if there's any time when the freeway's not working, we have to have a backup. So this neighborhood, very sadly, for over 50 years, has put up with a number of fatalities and uh, uh, just for the possibility that they want to keep the traffic uh, flowing if they have an incident on the interstate. But I want to build this uh, entire topic of equity, tie it closely to health, uh, by sharing that when we do walk in out of we really strive to be very inclusive, not only to work in the neighborhoods that need the help so much, but uh, to, to really be able to build that dialogue, build that network of support so that we can go in and be supportive of, of the communities uh, uh, through, throughout the, the country. But I wanna dive even deeper into this topic that so many of the street widenings that have occurred have been done at the cost to those communities that are most diverse, that are the baseline for uh, walking, bicycling, transit, 
the people who are running our cities when we're uh, now uh, uh, learning the best we can from webinars, they're out there performing the services. And truly, this is the kind of a partnership that uh, we induced with regional travel demand and insistence on getting people out to where they live and impacting the lives. So this is gonna be so important in all of our work going forward, but it's not gonna be any easy task. So Mark and I are delighted that we can bring the uh, power of the walking audit uh, to full fruition. When either Mark or I lead walking audits, and I'd love to get your comments here too, Mark, uh, we are not just looking at the physical environment, we're looking at what that environment has done uh, to the people and how they behave. So I'm always looking at what the pedestrians are doing. Uh, the upper uh, uh, photo is in uh, South Beach, Miami, probably 35 years ago when I took that photo. This woman is doing something I call stealing home, uh, borrowing from um, baseball lingo. She's getting as far out as she can and, and feeling that she can do safely. Notice that's right where we'd have a curb extension. And uh, in, in this case, she knows she's gonna walk slower and this is her only way to survive. The lower photo, also in South Beach, why is this gentleman crossing where he is? He's that close to the intersection. And I hope uh, you're all coming up with the right answer. In, in this case, the gentleman had to lean against a car because there was no curb extension. And uh, so this is what I'm hopeful of, that people on the walks are gonna be able to pick up on uh, the, the behavior of the pedestrians and the behavior of the motorists and why the built environment is inducing this. I was in Boston doing some work at one time and I noticed the young people and the older woman all uh, using different approaches to getting across the street, a little bit of stealing home in advance. They know what they can get away with because they're quick footed. But the older woman, very interestingly, the younger folks were both in the street and completely out of the street before she got both feet into the street. So we need to be very sensitive to uh, building for all. And I'll, I'll, I'll say that if we're not meeting the needs of a, an 80 year old person, then truly we've, we've misdesigned uh, what, whatever roads. Some additional thoughts about why we do uh, walk-in audits, and you're gonna see uh, these unfold in just a moment, that we have uh, the opportunity to really bring media attention to what we're striving to do. So I'm very hopeful that as you go forward with walking audits, that you're able to get both print and broadcast media to, to change their stories to where they aren't just talking about how a, a sad tragedy occurred, but what their community is doing to address uh, 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 the, the changes that need to occur, to build the empathy, to build the understanding and to diversify what we do. I was in uh, Tucson, Arizona, doing some work when uh, sadly the night before I came, a, a child had been killed in traffic as a pedestrian. And we had every media outlet within a hundred miles come and take part in the walking audit. And I think it made a big impact. So uh, always try to include the media and get them to where they can see and understand and uh, share the story. When we do walk in out, we have these wonderful, uh, delightful surprises where uh, people join us who just saw us, came across the street in this case, and shared with us what challenges he faces as an older uh, pedestrian. This is on the uh, big island of Hawaii where Mark and I both led walking audits. And other wonderful things that occur. Uh, we were leading the walk-in audit and uh, we had uh, active officers who came and joined us and uh, greeted the, uh, with, with great empathy and great sensitivity. I think they came collectively to realize 
uh, how much they needed to work together to work on the built environment and make this particular neighborhood uh, much stronger and more focused on people. With that said, let me move to another segment and now talk about the tools uh, we like to have in place when possible, even before we get to a community. And by the way, all of these uh, uh, slides, both Mark's and mine, uh, will be available to you so, so that uh, if we're moving a little faster than normal note taking, you'll still be able to grab all the concepts. We always strive for diversity and uh, uh, we definitely uh, want to have the neighborhood leaders, key staff, and uh, the elected leaders, business leaders, fire and police, amazing things we get when we get uh, this kind of a diversity on a, on a walk. Mark, what would you add to this list? I wanna make this a little interactive. What would you add to this list? I would just say that this is the, the moment where you can make or break a walk audit um, by virtue of who you get there. For example, I think we often manage to, to not get folks that are involved in housing or in the transit authority, right? We think about, uh, we'll end up, it's easy to end up with the usual suspects on a walk audit, the folks who are the pedestrian advocates, uh, the folks who are thinking about physical activity promotion, engineering, public works, right? Um, but how about the residents of the neighborhood? You know, sometimes that's our biggest, and in, in particular, you know, the, the, the line we have at the end of this list here, those who don't necessarily attend workshops. I, I think that the greatest resonance can occur when you get somebody who would never show up at a public meeting, come to the planning offices or to the city hall or to the library for a, a classic, you know, public input meeting on a project, right? They might not even feel comfortable doing so, by the way. They might feel like maybe that's not a space that I should even be in. Um, but if a walk audit can be hosted in the community uh, and, and perhaps hosted by an entity uh, that is more uh, comfortable, you know, we've often worked with a local church or the Boys and Girls Club or, um, um, you know, a, a homeowners association or a, a community center, even better, right, in a, in a, in a community. Um, if that's the hosting entity, you can get those residents that might not otherwise normally engage. I think that's where some, some of the greatest stuff can be generated, the greatest ideas can be generated, and the greatest truth can be told about the built environment. Fantastic. Thank, thanks, Mark. And by the way, we've had walking audits with, uh, oh, no more than a dozen folks, but uh, we've also led walk audits with uh, over 120 people. Mm -hmm. uh, you need different equipment when you get very large numbers, but we, we, we find we don't need to set a limit uh, and naturally, uh, a number of people attending will fall out between 20 and 30, maybe 35. That's a pretty normal uh, number. Is, is that what you also get, Mark? Yep. And in the occasions when I know I'm going to have a larger group, I'll pre-scout the route. I'll think about spots where we can stop for conversation, where everybody can safely congregate out of the road, you know, a park. And, and I'll look for something I can stand on. Uh, you know, I'll say, OK, I'm going to climb on that bench or that low wall. And, and, and all 80 or 90 people will be able to be part of the conversation. Um, so you have to plan for those larger groups, but it can be done. Fantastic. Uh, so some of the work we do before we go in to do a walk audit is to find out what the walk score is. You could type in your own uh, home address and find out your specific or a store you like to go to downtown and uh, uh, Almost any town is going to have some very high numbers on a main street, but uh, you just go back a little ways from the main street and the numbers start to, to drop. A score of uh, a 60 or more is considered fairly good, but boy, when you get up in the 80s and 90s, you, you've hit nirvana. But the walk score only tells you proximity. It has nothing to do with the actual physical walking environment or if the stores are on the other side of the street from homes, you, you, this, this does not get picked up in the algorithm. So it's a good starting point, but it doesn't take you as far as uh, some other algorithms might do. We've used different assessment scoring sheets uh, for Ventura, California. I once put these together just to show those qualities that we look for, things like human scale, is there a well-defined, memorable town center? All these things uh, really dictate whether people will come down and walk or open a business or not. So 
you might want to look at that. Uh, and again, this is just an example of uh, what we're looking for. But notice the categories that we've listed here. I think every one of those is, is uh, uh, as important as the crossings and the sidewalks themselves and, and the street. So, Mark, I'd like to get your input on this, but when I do a walking audit, I always say it's all about how much time we spend. And if we're constrained to 60 or 90 minutes, rarely do we go more than a third of a mile. Uh, that, that, in fact, is a, an upward limit. There are some walking in odds we'll do where we have bus support uh, so that we've been transported to two or sometimes three uh, locations. But uh, this is a fairly uh, important thing to do is to make sure that your sponsors that you're working with uh, allow you to include a lot of things, but in a short compact space. Mark, anything said? Yeah, two choices here. One is, as you say, partnering with transit, which I really like because it engages the transit agency. So you can do a one-way walk and cover more distance because one of our goals is to often not just show one type of environment. Maybe we want to show some of the stuff that people are going to score very well on the walk and then stuff that's going to be more challenging because that comparison is helpful. And that might be easier to do if we walk in one direction, hop on the bus and come back or vice versa. Second, um, if if I do want to try to cover more distance, what we might do is walk continuously for a while to designated stop points. You know, I have taken walks that have been as much as a mile uh, or even a mile and a half as a part of a walk audit, but that, that sometimes in an environment where we have very long blocks and the character doesn't change very much on the block, so we'll walk a good distance where it's all one character, then stop and discuss, okay, what did we see for the last 400 yards? Um, and so if you stop less frequently and then dedicate to your point, Dan, the time to the actual interaction and discussion, that's really where you wanna put your time in, let people reflect on what they saw. And importantly, it is not the expert telling the participants what the answer is, it's the facilitator enabling an, a process of shared discovery among the participants. That's really, really important. Fantastic. And I'll add to that that uh, the longest uh, walking audit that I got to uh, be part of uh, was in Columbus, Ohio. It was 120 degrees. We started at 7 in the morning and we finished at 7 at night. People would join us about every 90 minutes, a, a new part of the neighborhood. So it was a continuous walk, uh, but boy, it's one of the most powerful walks we ever led. We were redesigning the entire neighborhood and uh, I. I'll always remember that day. It was such a great day. So many discoveries. Different communities are going to have different resources for you to study in advance. Uh, this is a rarity where they'll actually map out what the traffic counts are. It's helpful to both Mark and I to know what the volumes of traffic are based on what our possibilities are. Notice the lower street uh, that uh, at the far right side, we're running with uh, approximately 14,000 cars. That uh, a number tells us that we can get by with a three-lane road. If it's already four, then that's a perfect road diet. But we get up somewhere uh, toward the freeway uh, where the loading becomes much heavier. Uh, we, we just have to honor uh, the traffic in, in that case. But even with traffic projection increases, uh, we can, by knowing these numbers, uh, we, there's a lot that that we now know that we can talk through with the community. We also look at the street connectivity. Uh, so when there, let's let's take the road that's marked in blue that's uh, running uh, east-west, I guess, by orientation. That's a pretty high traffic count. Uh, it's not impossible for a road diet, but notice if we just go up a single block we could probably change that into a bicycle boulevard or a, a green street. Uh, and uh, so these are useful things for us to know. And then it helps inform uh, where we might go on the walk, uh, e even though the principal road that we're designing might be the uh, blue road. We know we have some options that we can uh, further power up walkability, bicycling, and uh, uh, so on. Speed, uh, on, in rare occasions, the community will have done the homework and really uh, uh, laid down the rubber hoses, figured out the, the speeds on a variety of streets. 
Uh, some streets will pop out. We'll know where we need to do uh, traffic calming, for example, or uh, need some different tools that we might otherwise use. This is a very helpful uh, tool for us to have. And again, these aren't ordinary things you'll find in a community, but we're hopeful that over time that uh, this will become more commonplace. Uh, what equipment to use? I uh, used to use the Fat Max as my ruler. Uh, I loved the process of, of splaying it out into the street. I know I could do it a little safer and a little easier with a wheel, but there's something very uh, interesting that, that occurs. Always, always include uh, cameras. Digital uh, cameras uh, uh, can be lightweight, and you can also use iPhones very effectively with how advanced they become. And as Mark and I say, the mustache is optional. So here, uh, just an example, uh, we measure a street. I think this one was 80 feet across. It was a two lane road, but boy, does it ever make the, the point uh, when we uh, did this. Sometimes I'll take a, a pocket recorder uh, just to keep very accurate notes and uh, occasionally a pocket radar gun. They're, they're as simple and as small as a, as a pocket phone anymore. Mark, any other tools you'd add? No, you've really hit the, the highlights there, I think. And, and don't get burdened by this stuff. Just use them to illustrate points and preferably points that your participants are making, right? Respond to what Excellent. they're discovering. Excellent. And by the way, when you measure street, always measure from the center of the ADA ramp uh, to, to the opposite side uh, ADA ramp. That gives you your correct measurement. There are other ways to measure, and if you want to do it very simpler, simply, <laughs> uh, Jim Charlier uh, came up with this list, and I, I like this a lot, right? So if you're doing just some kind of a quick summary report, uh, it might be good to scale what areas are openly hostile, uh, all the way down to those that, uh, in the highest order, are truly placed. You're not just trying to support walking, uh, you're you're really nailing it by creating the authentic places are going to make the most money, uh, bring back the greatest increases in walking, cycling, and so on. There are a number of types of walking audits that we like to do, and I'll go through all of these uh, fairly quickly. I'm trying to watch the time. So we geared up to do a mega project to redesign all of Waikiki. We had five different consulting firms working on this project, plus about 20 city staff. And so one of the most critical parts of our work uh, in, in Waikiki was to uh, do two days worth of uh, technical walking audits, different portions of neighborhoods, and amazingly effective what we were learned and how well positioned we were to come in and be able to listen uh, to the community. We uh, do the technical walks. We like to hear from each staff member and kind of put them on the spot for their 30 seconds of fame of what they uh, have as takeaways. They, uh, and uh, typically we let them know we're gonna do this in advance so that they're well prepared to you know, truly talk about uh, what changes they're now going to perform, not just in that project, but on all future uh, street making projects they do. It's it's amazingly transformative, and it's fun to uh, 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 gather this information and to record it. Mark, do you ever do this technique? Yeah, yeah, yes. In fact, I think one of the most important parts of a successful walk audit is that some sort of debrief afterwards where you let people download their takeaways. Even if it's not a full on charrette or design session, if you don't do something like this at the end, you've really missed the opportunity because the act of people saying what they've taken away out loud sort of locks it in their minds as well. Um, so Very I think it's really important. Yep. Yep. Now, following the technical audits, and often we can do them on the same day when we come in as a, a consultant team, is to then do the public audit. But we want the technical audit first uh, when we have that opportunity. It's a bigger project when we do this. But uh, holy cow, uh, the public uh, audit, audits are just so fun. 
uh, when we do workshops, full-fledged workshops, or even many charrettes, people will always tell us it was the walking audit that was most important. It also gives people variety. Some people just do not like to come to meetings. It's, it's just not what they do. But the, the idea of a walking audit is novel. It's something uh, that they find fun. Uh, they can interact. Uh, and uh, it, th this one, I believe, is in Newport. But we'll, we'll dig into all kinds of places, including those where here we've gone into a back alley and talked about how to activate the alley. Mark, what are some of the things you like to do with your public audits? Well, I, I would add that, that, you know, sort of these are, uh, I think, really huge opportunities to get people to think differently. And you, you, sometimes you're un, they're unconstrained by sort of the rules, right? You know, if you, the public doesn't, and particularly youth, for example, they don't know that the ADT on that road is over 12,000 and therefore we can't do that there, right? They're not bound by the rules and the framework. So I, I really think that as we think about the public, it's in particular important to, to give people the opportunity to throw out their wacky ideas or observations and, and not let them be called wacky, right? I think that's the most important. And sometimes I will even ask for that. I'll say, what's your wackiest idea? What's the craziest thing you could do with this alley? Inevitably, one of those ideas that somebody throws out becomes the one that the group grabs onto and really loves. So un unburdening people with, with the constraint is important in this, in this phase. Fantastic. And one walking audit we did that we went into an alley uh, people dreamed up beautiful ideas, and we were able to get a $750,000 arts grant uh, to make it into an art walk and uh, power up brand new businesses in the alley. It was fab fabulous. My favorite style of walking on it is a, a mobile study tour. They can be as little as half a day, uh, but typically we like to do, do multiple days. This is transformative. We've now done four three-day mobile study tours for uh, uh, all of Hawaii, but we bring them to the Pacific Northwest. And uh, it is amazingly transformative. We change careers for folks. One gentleman on one of our walks said he was about to turn in his resignation the following Monday, but now he was rededicated uh, to, to redesign. These, these take a lot of work to set up, but boy, do we ever get amazing impacts. When we do the, the uh, study tours, uh, we uh, will always invite in the local uh, specialists, the guests, the engineers, the planners, the developers, and really let people hear the, the key story. Uh, in fact, one we did for the uh, Institute of Transportation Engineers in uh, Florida, a national conference they were holding, and uh, this was a full day tour. I want to say we visited six towns, including meeting up with Mayor Nancy Graham, the amazing woman who totally transformed that community. Uh, so these are powerful to tools that you can apply. I think, John, we're set up to do this as a, a, a question. Uh, or did we? No, the, poll, the poll comes in about three slides, Dan. Uh, three slides. Okay. Okay. Slides. What I'd like you to be thinking about, uh, if you were to scale this, uh, what, what would, what would, what kind of a score would you uh, select on walkability, on 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 uh, active transportation, and uh, so have this image in mind, uh, as this happens to be in Sault Su Ste. Marie. So let's talk about uh, some other tools people apply. Now this can be done with a much smaller team. Uh, in, in this case, two to four people is all you need, but it's, it's fun uh, to do if, if you have a blank city map to go out and figure out, in this case, how secure you feel on a given street. So notice this uh, mapped out in those areas that need work, those areas that are already pretty good, this happens to be Orlando. Uh, sense of shade, uh, many of our communities, uh, we're really gonna have to work hard to get the shade built back in. The same city knows how little shade uh, exists in downtown Orlando at the time this was done, about 20 years ago. And then uh, aesthetically, uh, how do you feel? Do you feel comfortable? Do you feel that this is a memorable place and things like that? So all these things can be mapped out. And again, this is not done in a large group setting. 
it, it could even be done uh, by a, a local group uh, ahead of time so that they can report out uh, at a workshop that you do. Okay, so this is our first um, survey we'd like you to take. And uh, in this case, score this, and I believe it's a scale of one to five. Uh, and then we're uh, also uh, write down some notes if you don't mind. Why do you give it whatever score you gave? And uh, so I think we're pausing long enough for folks to to do that. Right. Yeah. This is a poll. Yeah. This is our second poll, and the idea here is just give this a one to five score, and uh, when that score when that comes up, uh, you'll you'll see descriptions. It's very similar to what John Jim Charlier is scoring from you know sort of you'd give it a one if you felt it was hope, openly hostile, and you'd give it a five if you thought it was great uh, for walking. But, yep. I think it's coming up right now. And then we're going to see another picture in a second and have you score that again and then compare the two. So hopefully that first poll is coming up, or the second, it's actually our second of three polls is coming up right now. There it is. Oh, oh wow. So you're, you're, all right. Oh, I think you may have, did you guys cut it short? The numbers, the numbers, okay. We're yeah, waiting for the numbers to come up. Here, okay, they'll come, the that. numbers will show I as think, people respond. I think, I think Michael launched it and then I clicked it and closed it at the same time. So okay. Um, okay. unfortunately, okay. we can't do it now because he jumped okay. the gun. Okay. Why don't so, we, uh, why don't we forge it and then show the second picture, Dan? Why don't you advance to the next photo and let people okay. score that? I think I need control of my screen back again. You've got it. Everybody, get this image in your mind of this photo because there's we're gonna. Dan has an interesting point he's gonna make. Think about what your score would have been for here: five if it's great, one if it's zero, if it's crummy, something in between. And then uh, hey, go ahead and advance two some, slides. Somehow I've lost control of the screen. Nope, you have it. You just have to click on your PowerPoint. Yeah. Oh, how cool is that? Okay. Well, it didn't. Okay, so here's the second image. And by the way, go ahead and uh, score. One, don't tell yeah, them yet. Don't don't say anything yet. So there's the poll. Okay, there you go. Now go ahead and poll everybody. You're going to select one of those five. It's either wonderful, you know, um, good, acceptable, poor, or bad. You know, those descriptions. Um, very similar to, to to Jim's outline. You know, sort of at the top, it's a place. It, had, it feels like it has its own value to be there versus openly hostile to walk there. I think in a moment here we'll see results from this as you're responding, hopefully. So if anybody has, has a full screen mode, you may need to minimize that so you can get to the poll. For some reason, you can't vote in it. Um, and keep in mind, we're doing this actively during a walk audit. So the whole point of this is I frequently will have the group stand as we're getting the results to come up here and say, OK, where would you score this uh, on a 1 to 10 or a 1 to 5 scale? And I have people shout their numbers out. So we kind of create an ad hoc average. What you're seeing here, um, this looks like it scores pretty well, this one. Yeah, I see a lot of folks that are in the top two categories, either wonderful or good. Yeah, um, that's that's 90 percent. Uh, well, yeah. here's the fun part of this is that the scene you saw first, and then this one, is nothing more than a photo morph. These are these are the exact same location, same camera angle, even. So when we work with the community, what we're trying to get across is how would you slow down the speeds? How would you create places for walking, uh, eyes on the street, all of these things. So uh, that's pretty amazing. So I'm going to see if I can advance. <laughs> Good. And I'd remind okay. people that there's a there's a hierarchy there of, of solutions from just planting some trees and painting a, a mid-block crosswalk to reconfiguring the road. And it's important to help people understand not everything is the million dollar answer. There are some of the lower costs, easier things to do first that get you there that might get the score from a one to a two or a two to a three before you get all the way to the five. Exactly. So um, now what do we score? And uh, when we do the walk-in audit, what are we looking for? I like to include four, maybe even five or six items when we do a, uh, a, a full walk-in audit. Uh, but this is just a partial list of those things you might include. You could also add in waterfronts, 
uh, parks, uh, any of a number of things that uh, are important. To close out today, I'm just going to pick one, sidewalks, and show you the many things we might score on a, a walkability audit that's featuring sidewalks. Uh, when we come back to part two, uh, which we'll talk about at the end, then uh, we would do all the rest of these categories. We might even drum, dream up a few more for you. And uh, just as we're going to do here, we're going to break down those things uh, that we consider the most important. So uh, obviously, uh, the width of the sidewalk is something that people always consider. But look at all these other categories. Uh, so if you're going to have walking and you're only looking at sidewalks, uh, these are the things that we would measure in that process. So to give you just a little bit about the richness, the diversity of things we're looking for, a good quality sidewalk has three zones. Uh, uh, it's got to have very distinct edges. Anyone who's blind, it always needs a shoreline to work from. You want it to work uh, all hours of the day, so you need good lighting. Uh, if you happen to be fortunate to have off uh, on-street parking or a bike lane, it further separates, creates a buffer. The ground cover is important, where you put all the furniture that it is behaving nicely. So these are the things that you might look for in a near commercial area. Uh, this happens to be uh, still uh, a non-commercial on this side. Uh, another example, uh, when you do the sidewalks, they should make it easy to get across the street. So we, we might score this in crosswalks later. Uh, it's also important that the sidewalk feel continuous and have all the right elements. Note, note that uh, in this case, uh, it's, it's got many, many different materials working uh, uh, to favor walking. So let's get into some of the categories. Width, uh, we were asked to develop these tools for HUD uh, to allow people to go out and score their communities. Uh, and starting with, with there isn't it, a sidewalk, all the way up to a very adequate width, uh, uh, all, the, all the various things that you uh, would want or need. Probably would work uh, today with uh, 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 COVID walks that people would take where they need to be physically separated. But there will be times you're constrained and you just can't go above an eight. Uh, there's no way to do it because of the physical terrain. That's a drop off there. We then measure another category. Uh, in this case, surface condition. Uh, anywhere from there is no sidewalk all the way up to Portland, Oregon uh, doing uh, pavers, real pavers. Uh, that have a high coefficient of friction so that people don't slip, rains there a lot. Uh, so again, you can substitute your own local photos if you wanted to do a more specific uh, style of measuring. We always measure maintenance. Uh, so many sidewalks uh, were, were never touched after they got built and they're worn out. And this is a very important thing uh, certainly, if you're going to score sidewalks, know where where they don't need to be touched for another 20 years and where they've just got to go back if you're going to uh, honor the needs of a person with a disability, an elder, and some um, sometimes even tripping a child. Buffers. Uh, if you don't have a good buffer, notice in zero, uh, where there is no buffer, the, the pedestrian here walks as far from, from the moving traffic as she can on up to number 10, we have just absolute dynamite buffers to, to the street. So another thing you would uh, want to score. But on the other side of the sidewalk, the buffers to parking lots or open lots or any of a number of things. Again, you could hit a dead zero <laughs> and uh, uh, go all the way up to the quality of the buffer on number 10 is not just a nice separation from the parking.
Uh, Dan, did you hit something? Uh, your audio went out. Well, we, Dan, we've lost you. So either you're muted or your something went out on your computer. He's offline. Okay. Well, I'm going to finish up then because we are there actually. If um, you would advance, oh, he's got the slides. You could throw the screen back to me, guys, if you'd like. And uh, thank you. Outstanding. Well done. Lightning speed. Um, so Dan was just finishing up um, the scoring here. And it's an important point about this exercise. Some places um, want a formalized scoring process like this. Others do not. Others would like to, to do a walk audit that's more qualitative. Um, this material can be provided to people ahead of time so that they can think about how are they going to score on the walk. Um, Dan was going to use this example from Henderson, Nevada to show the difference between an identically wide sidewalk uh, on the left and the right, same width, uh, the difference being all those other features, buffer, uh, adjoining materials, um, uh, and so on. And and I think the, the, the point there, um, we really want people to be able to use, have their own experience. In other words, an untrained person, somebody who is not an architect, not a planner, their opinion on this is valid. So, so the scoring mechanism, you, you really walk a fine line, how structured you want that to be, how much you really want to focus um, on, on the technical details versus allow people to feel the difference. Um, so here's where we're at. We're going to wrap up today. Uh, these are more of the technical elements that Dan will explore a little further next time, the kind of things that we either teach people about or at least try to tease out during the conversation while we're walking. And I'm going to conclude in the next webinar um, with talking about walk audits with some 2020 vision. And, and that pun is quite intended, you know, sort of some insights from what's happening in the U.S. right now. Certainly, uh, I think it's really important for us to talk about methods to create truly inclusive walk audits that engage residents and really talk about the very hard things to talk about, like race and 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 neglected uh, um, um, sort of uh, uh, priorities that have just been overlooked for truly decades in some communities. Um, uh, virtual engagement. Here we are in a time where we may be having to do more of this, uh, this kind of virtual engagement. I've been doing some work with a uh, vir uh, virtual uh, technique called photo voice and uh, possible walk audits. And I think some of the demands that we're hearing during the TEM pandemic here, people's greater desire for nearby essential services, even the definition of essential services. People understand now when I'm doing a workshop where I talk about a grocery pharmacy and hardware and the post office being sort of the centerpiece of an effective downtown. Um, settings for safely distance walking and cycling and public spaces that support some of the social distancing we may be doing for some time going forward such as on street restaurant seating retail access things like that so we will hit some of these and certainly share more of our sort of big broad lessons learned uh, going forward um, and again I'll, I'll thank you and i think we do have some time for questions so i'm going to thank again michael and john for facilitating us and i'm happy to hang in uh, for questions gentlemen as appropriate Mark, if you guys can hear me, I'm back online. Oh, good. Yay, Dan's back. I got knocked off. So we see right. you. If you have the ability to turn on your webcams, we'll ask you to do that. And thanks to everybody who has submitted questions so far. You can continue to ask them. We'll we'll go to at least 2:30, maybe a little beyond, a couple minutes extra. And I'll mention this. Uh, so we have uh, said at the beginning, and both Dan and Mark have mentioned that we are doing a part two in two weeks on June 25th. We'll be sending out that registration link uh, shortly, probably with the uh, link to the audio for this one recording. Um, in conversations with both Mark and Dan about this, uh, we talked about the breadth of the material presented. So uh, some folks have been asking questions about some aspects that you, I think we'll be getting into in the future uh, section. So appreciate everybody kind of this deep dive that you've taken us to today. So I'm gonna start with this question. And again, if you all can turn on your webcams, if you have that ability today. Um, first question, maybe the most important one, and I think it, you've mentioned this a couple of times, but can I be a walkability expert if I don't have a great mustache? Is that possible? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we, uh, Mark, I think we should, should uh, provide mustaches. That should be in our kit, right? It happened when, when Dan and I worked on, on uh, in Wyoming and Jackson Hole's trail plan, the rest of the team sh showed up with tape on mustaches. Uh, I think they were making fun of us. No, no, you're, you will be better without a mustache, I am quite sure. We need diversity of non-mustache facilitators. <laughs> I concur. Excellent. 
Okay, next question is, what do you suggest as a good background of study to best be involved in this work as a career to make a real di difference? Is it public health, environmental something, or um, planning? Great question. Um, Mark, I'm gonna let you take the health side, but from a technical knowledge, uh, obviously you have to uh, read Death and Life of Great American Cities by Jane Jacobs. She's the the true uh, number one person in, in uh, America that figured all this out in 1961. But the book that I consider my Bible, and I was so enthused about it, but after I read it, I bought airline tickets, went to Europe, spent 30 days and read one chapter at a time. Christopher Alexander's uh, Pattern Language. So it, it's an amazing read. Uh, but Mark, what would you add to this, what areas of study? And things I like am that? seeing extraordinary skills from people across the discipline. So Danny on our team, Danielle Schaffner, her background is an epidemiologist, but she is a planner at heart, and she has essentially cross-educated herself in planning. And in fact, I'm going to suggest that the the people who I see really good at this are multidisciplinarian. So if you happen to have an engineering degree, then they're reaching out and and reading health journals around physical activity and health, um, or or learning about land use planning. Uh, planners I know, and in fact many planning departments are now hiring health planners, and health departments are <laughs> hiring health planners too. So there is a real call for multidisciplinary work. And as people, for example, will get degrees in public policy, but they will make sure they're taking GIS classes, they're taking public health classes, they're taking public policy classes. Um, I think that the next generation I'm seeing come up uh, to do this work have, have taken on very seriously the notion of rigorous training in areas that range from urban planning and some, some at least facility and engineering and public health, that those crossovers, as well as, by the way, a variety of other uh, 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 related fields as too, as you can imagine. So example, great folks in economic development and uh, even from Main Street associations do great walkability work. So rigor, breadth. Wonderful. Uh, Mark, I'll add to that. Uh, I, those of you know my background, I have no degrees whatsoever in the fields that uh, would address walkability. I am not an architect, not a planner, not an engineer, not a landscape architect. I came in this through the, the door called passion and learned as much as I could, got mentored by the best. So if you don't feel like you're already school, don't feel that that should hold you back. Uh, there are people that want you to succeed in, in this field. Uh, but boy, once you get into it, there's every book in the world that you can uh, turn to, uh, every webinar you can watch. Excellent, okay, thanks. Um, next question, uh, kind of about the structure of these. Uh, would you want to break up the larger group into smaller ones? So instead of 80 people, break it up to, into multiple groups of 20 or 30? Yes, let me make a first pitch on this. We definitely do that. Uh, when we are fully staffed for a walking audit, uh, we will uh, have two walk audit leaders. Uh, we may even pick the same route. We'll have uh, one team uh, go one direction on the same route and one of the other. And then at midpoint, we split and just change groups. That way, the uh, the people on the walking audit get, say, both Mark and I, or both Dan Danny and I. Uh, or whatever. Uh, Mark, do you have any variations to add to that? I was just going to say exactly that. Um, uh, the other thing I've started doing, and, and when I'm going to speak at a lot of public health conferences, I'm coming in the day before doing a walk audit facilitator training. I believe Dan and I both believe strongly we need to grow the tent and we'd love for more people to take this on. So I've spent as much as four hours an afternoon before prepping teams. If we knew we were gonna have 120, 150 participants in walk audits the next day. So we prep them the day before. We even pre-scout routes together. We get right down to the nitty gritty. Where are you gonna stop with your group? What are, you, what are you gonna make sure gets pointed out? If nobody in the group mentions it, don't you think we should make sure we should point out the lack of ADA ramps here or how how great this would be for a curb extension. So in other words, we I'm increasingly spending time helping uh, tutor folks to facilitate walk audits so we can handle larger groups with teams. And the other thing we often do is create facilitator teams. So rather than just send the planner or the public health person out alone, we'll have a planner and a public health person take that training together and then act as a two-person facilitation team so you have both of their insights and expertise. Um, I think that that's one of the important things we should do more of. 
But I love when Dan and I have done the thing where we both walk. He walks clockwise. I walk counterclockwise around a loop. We meet at the halfway point, switch teams, and then everybody gets a, a flavor of each of our perspectives on the environment. Okay. Another question about how they're done. How do you determine the day of the week to hold the audit? Staff, such as uh, public employees, usually likes to meet midweek between 8 and 5 p.m., but average citizens with jobs prefer weekends. Do you, how do you time it so that you can really attract potential working folks? Great question. Uh, let me lead on this. Uh, when, when we're given full permission in, in a community, we will do two different days. So we'll do, say, a Friday and Saturday, uh, uh, we'll do the technical work on Friday when, when uh, normal staff hours. Uh, but we find a lot of citizens, a lot of residents, other stakeholders are uh, more available on a Saturday. Uh, now, there are always competitions in time, but uh, we've, we've done pretty well uh, with that kind of a mix. We could also do them on the same day, but different times. Uh, and we really, although we cover different topics in a technical audit than we do a public audit, if the public's invited to the technical audit, they get it. They join in and and uh, and there's a wonderful dialogue and a mix between the technical folks and so on. So pick a day uh, that works best. Uh, and if you can only do one, then you can do that mix. But we love to do them on a, on a say a Friday, uh, Saturday, dual connection another, another option is same day a midday one and an evening one you know and and then the, the, one of the solutions to that challenge i have found is a late afternoon time slot so you you do something like a 4 30 or a five o'clock start time so that you're only asking staff to stay an hour or so beyond their normal day and you're asking folks to participate to maybe push dinner back a little later come from work come right to it and participate so um but we always ask this question very explicitly of stakeholders in the community to try to find a time where you can make sure you get the mix and you don't if your goal is to get the public involved to build a time when it really works for the residents including by the way thinking about things like child care and whether we want to provide food so in a lot of the work that we did in hawaii they said culturally it was really cool to um offer people a meal in the evening because that that would also be a social time over which we could have conversation um, and it would allow people to come from work, come have the meal, participate in the walk. Um, so think about creative constructs. Um, I've done that in some communities where breakfast, where where the local culture is that they're early morning risers. So ranching communities in the in the Mountain West, they've said what we really want to do is meet at seven, give people breakfast, you know, have the coffee. Um, strong enough to stand up a horseshoe, and that's the, literally a quote from one of the person, the people that was helping facilitate, and do the walk first thing in the morning, and then people can be back at work ready to go by 8.30, 9 o'clock. Okay, thanks, Mark. Uh, next question is, living in Wisconsin, much of the reasons my community uses to resist improvements to infrastructure, like painting crosswalks, bump outs, raised medians, and so on, are issues with snow plowing. Do you have any words of wisdom to address this resistance? That always comes up. And uh, one thing that we're very careful to do is say, okay, you have variations. You could do put in treatments that are going to work and work well, but which can be pulled out in the winter. That's a that's a worst case scenario. But the other is to challenge challenge folks and say, don't design your communities for your snow plow operators. Train them instead. Uh, same thing with transit. Sometimes uh, we're told you can't do certain things because of transit. And yet there are dozens of communities in the same region that have already figured that one out. So, but yeah, there's a whole list of very common things. We can't do this because, right? There must be at least 100 you and I have identified, Mark. What would you add to that? So yeah, a couple of really important ones here. One, uh, set up an inexpensive demonstration project. Do something with temporary paint, with some planters, cones. Uh, I, we did one in northern Vermont where they both snowplow, and the town also happened to host a, um, there's a, a, a truck driving school there where people earn their CDL truck license. So we're talking articulated, you know, tractor trailer trucks. And we asked the, the instructor from that school to participate in the walk audit and to actually, as we started it, to come and drive his truck through around these temporary curb extensions that had been put in to check whether they could be driven around. Um, and you could do the same with plow drivers. So point number one, lesson number one here is 
ask the very stakeholder that you're talking about to participate, the plow drivers, the fire department, who might say our trucks can't navigate this intersection, the transit driver, do not set them up as adversaries. On the contrary, set them up as problem solvers by being participants in, in the, the audit. Uh, this gentleman, by the way, drove it and afterwards said, you know, I'm thinking the width, you had the diameters right, but you should have it be a, a moldable curb for the for the driver who's not good enough and might roll up and don't put any vertical elements within a couple of elements. You know, if you're going to put in planters or bollards or something, move them back a foot or two to give the driver a little extra swing room. And he said, and this right before the village board, as we were doing the walkout, he said, I think these things are great because I'm going to be able to see pedestrians better as a truck driver coming out from behind the parked vehicles I'm not because of the curb extension. And furthermore, any driver who can't navigate around these, if properly designed, shouldn't be driving a truck and I won't give them their license. Um, uh, so needless to say, he was strongly opinionated, but he added so much to the conversation and, and our insights about the design. So even setting up temporary treatments that can be adjusted on the fly. Uh, can be very effective. Beautiful. Excellent. Um, next question. When in the planning process do you rec recommend doing the walking audits? Early I just got on. A yeah. Early, early. Yes, yeah, so I just get early. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> as early as you can. Uh, uh, yeah, if you're going through, say, the rebuild of a corridor uh, or, or laying out a school or whatever, do it it was one of the very first things that gets done so it helps guide uh, all of the design features yeah yeah and we we find you know earlier it's easier to reach out to stakeholders like a department of transportation if it's a state route you know state dot's are often painted as the bad guy oh state dot won't let us do that um it's a lot easier for them. They have long project timelines. They're looking at budgets five years out. You know, it's hard for us to show up at the last minute and say, oh, geez, we'd love you to widen the shoulders here, turn them into bicycle lanes or a protected bike lane on one side. Um, much easier to do that and budget for it and plan it and engineer it if we do that early in the process. So I think out of respect for or for often the, the engineering agencies and, and construction folks, uh, the earlier we get in, the better we can do in, in solving problems or, or, or coming up with great solutions. Okay, thanks, Mark. Uh, next question here. The needs of the elderly are often highlighted in, in the impediments to walkability in our built environment. What are some of the impediments for the black community in achieving walkable communities? Well, number one in my experience is that uh, they've, we have often simply neglected to engage uh, um, uh, people of color uh, across the board. Um, and, and, and we need to remedy that. So, so this walk audit, discussion is an appropriate place to ask that question and say what can we do to do better um, a, a good friend and colleague um, of mine charles brown is is i think one of the leading lights regarding thinking about this advocating uh, i've had the great fortune he's at rutgers university and i've had the great good fortune of leading some walk audits with him and and he says you know one of the first things we've got to do is reach out and ask people to participate and engage them in ways that are comfortable and in places that are familiar to them don't make me go somewhere else to do a walk audit to have my voice heard come to me in my community come to me with people who look like me and will make me feel comfortable to be part of the conversation and who are in no way threatening um, there are so many things that we need to do better um and and i think that 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 it, it starts there, right? Because I can't, how can I know the answer for a community? Do you guys want bicycle lanes here? Or I just assume bicycle lanes are a good solution for a road because I'm a bike lane guy, right? That's, I believe, multimodalism. And people might say, the reality is how many people here have bikes? Uh, that's not of interest, but I gotta tell you, the quality of the transit service and frequency of the service and the quality of these bus stops, all of them say uh, transit's not important. It's a one hour frequency, but I'm not gonna, I'm never gonna have that conversation or learn that if participants from the community that use that transit system aren't in the conversation, right? We won't even get there. So to me, I, I believe one of the biggest barriers, if I can be so bold, and I speak, I've gotta admit, I'm speaking, I'm a classic part of the problem because I'm speaking from a position of white privilege, right? I'm a white male who, you know, sort of can only say that the remedy has to come from my learning from others who have the lived experience and can help me get there. Um, and so that's my job. My job is to ask for guidance and help and be open to um, a level of engagement that I think we have, for the most part, not done a very good job collectively of getting that level of engagement. Well said, Mark. And I'll add to that. Yeah. 
let me add so that. This is, this is worth its own two-hour webinar and more, yeah. right? I, I don't mean to. It, no, it, we'll, I hope I don't. It all's right. No, no I, I hope we record everything uh, that that comes up. Uh, so with that, yeah, um, Michael, next question, or or do you want to end this time? No, we'll we'll go till maybe about ten more minutes if that's okay for you, because we have yeah. still about six hundred people online and uh, many questions here. Uh, next one is, have you developed a set of idealized sidewalk designs for different road functions and locations within a city? For example, a sidewalk in a downtown area with on-street parking versus a sidewalk in a suburban residential area with no on-street parking. I think the answer is yes, and it's not just what uh, we've done as aficionados of walking, but NACTO now has some beautiful guides uh, on local streets. We're going to get into... Uh, quite a bit of detail in the next call part two and i'll i'll make sure we accent that uh, and break break sidewalks for example into main streets uh neighborhoods uh hillside neighborhoods there are so many factors that uh contribute to how we design a particular sidewalk in fact i'll i'll confess i live on a street with no sidewalks and we'll never have sidewalks in this street i'm on a hillside and uh, a sidewalk here would cost every homeowner over thirty thousand dollars we just can't do it and we love walking in the street uh, so sometimes a particular topic like a sidewalk is so driven by the multiple factors that uh, we can give you some some buckets you can go for but but it's almost always going to be a combination of buckets what would you add to that mark I would just say that there are some great resources that reflect lots of really highly qualified thought in that regard, sort of different designs for different settings. And I agree that the NACTO guides, so the National Association of City Transportation Officials, if that's not familiar to you, go right to their website and look at their uh, bikeway design guide, urban street design guide, their transit street design guide. In other words, there are some great guidance documents that continue to add more. And I really want to call out the Federal Highways Administration um, uh, does a document called Small Town and Multimodal small town and rural multimodal networks guide. Um, and what's interesting about it is it is relevant uh, for obviously small town and rural settings, but I've found many suburban communities see some of the treatments there as appropriate for some of their lower volume of streets and, and roadways. Um, so the point is lots of work has been done and, and it continues to increase uh, and, and there's good guidance on creative solutions, particularly when you have things like right of way restrictions and you know, you're not going to be able to just expand the road or the, the corridor by 10 feet to add a five foot bike lane with, or a, I'm sorry, a five foot sidewalk with a five foot separator buffer. It's just simply not available. Um, so the FHW got a uh, small town and rural multimodal network guide is worthy of a call out. We'll include, by the way, at the end of the second webinar, a whole list of resources that you guys can access. Great, thanks. So we'll ask just a few more here and then close for today. And I'll uh, share all the questions with the presenters so that you have them uh, in preparation for the next next one. Excellent. Okay, so the next question is, what are the key strategies to advance walkability in rural areas with lower population density, yet unmet needs for walking and bicycling options for access to community centers? So needless to say, I'll go right back to the guide I just mentioned. I really think there's some powerfully effective solutions in there. I've done some work in uh, North Central and Northwestern Vermont with a healthcare organization up there, interestingly, and I'm back to my pitch, connect with the healthcare people. Um, uh, and uh, it's called, uh, and their initiative is called Rise Vermont, and they've done some really great work. And, and notably, we were in some very small town and rural settings where some of the solutions came, you know, the proposed solutions came right out of that guide that might be appropriate for lower density settings. Um, we are finding often that I, I, some of my work with the Centers for Disease Control, we're also in much more rural parts of the country, uh, and yet we're finding people realize that the, the hamlets, the village centers, I mean, we're not going to put a sidewalk on every rural road, right? Um, but that, for example, adding shoulders can actually um, um, improve uh, the resilience of a roadway, reduce the, uh, uh, um, the de decomposition at the edge, and, and so can be better from a safety standpoint, and provide, for example, potential, potential pedestrian and bicycle space. So simply repaving with shoulders, even on rural routes, is an appropriate treatment. But in other cases, the best thing to do is focus on the hamlets, on the centers, on the population locations, and make those the most walkable, bikeable destinations. Um, and I will also add that we do find in rural communities 
sometimes work on separated trails, and we will talk about trails next week, um, uh, um, or next webinar, trail corridors, uh, former either utility corridors, former rail corridors, are sometimes easier to work with than in more urbanized settings. So um, separate trails, multi-use pathways, can be an appropriate solution for rural settings as well. Thank you. So well, I guess one last question and we'll have to wrap up. Um, this is really wonderful. Science, though, is finding alarming declines in insects and birds and that urban areas can play an important role in supporting them. Do your walking audits ever focus on non-human species that are supported too uh, for urban biodiversity? Well, yes. I will say this. Uh, I see uh, our, the, uh, the um, sensibility about green space, foliage, uh, uh, sort of uh, how much paving, how much impervious surface we're creating, which is very much related to what, what is being referenced here, has uh, risen substantially in people's awareness. In other words, people are far more aware of those things and far more ready to talk about them and talk about development practices that are, I think, supportive of greater diversity of both flora and fauna in even, yes, urban settings. So I'm seeing a, a subtle movement in that direction, and I think I support the questioner's notion that we should do more of that. That's, that's totally uh, on track. Sometimes we'll do walking audits that focus mostly on the natural environment and how the urban environment and natural environment need to be partners. And uh, uh, we make sure that we get the, the ecologists and uh, environmental sciences on those walks. And it's just fascinating when we're able to do that. But yes, we leave no field untouched make make sure that we we cover these topics fully yep okay, thanks dan and part of the reason we divided it up was to give uh, more time for questions and even with that um we have many more that we will need to tackle next time so with that i guess i'll ask if you have some closing thoughts or maybe some additional segue to the next conversation we'll have in two weeks you know one thing i'll i'll say is that uh, we are in the most remarkable of times. Uh, throughout my entire lifetime, I'm 76, I never even dreamed we'd be given this opportunity to correct the mistakes we made uh, during the, the last century. Uh, there are so many things that now need to be corrected. And uh, only 50% of the built environment that we're going to need by the year 2050 has been built. So our opportunity to, to go out change the way we look at communities to be inclusive of all, to uh, induce walking and bicycling, make them natural activities, uh, to, to support transit, maybe do everything a little different. We, we couldn't have asked for a better window to open. I'm just hoping we can stay, stay ahead of the uh, truly the tsunami of change we're facing. Mark? I'll only add that, that we may be at a, a moment uh, and one of those rare opportunities. If there's a lot of money spent as part of stimulus dollars coming out of the pandemic and so on, um, it is it is exceptionally important that every voice on this uh, on this webinar and everybody else that you can reach make sure uh, that we focus our efforts around the lessons that we're learning right now, uh, around social justice and race, as well as around resilience against both infectious and chronic disease. There is a, a we've got to, if we're going to spend trillions on, on an infrastructure bill, for example, we better make sure that it is informed by what we're learning at this very moment, this, this upheaval, um, because it is a rare opportunity. So every one of your voices, be a part of the conversation and be actively engaged. Great, thanks, Mark. So with that, we'll conclude our webinar today, Walkability and Health, Building Strong, Vibrant, and Resilient Communities, part one. I'd like to offer a great big thank you to Dan Burden and to Mark Fenton for a great presentation, to all who attended, and to John Coleman, our communications and technology expert who helps to make all this happen. The complete recording of the, today's webinar will be posted on smartgrowth.org. Also, for those who have requested one, all attendees will receive an email that will contain a link to a personalized certificate of participation. Please look for that in a follow-up email. When you exit from today's webinar, you'll be asked to participate in a short evaluation. Please take a few moments to provide feedback so that we can continue to improve the webinar experience for you. And please join us as we present part two in this series on walkability and health. 
building strong, vibrant, and resilient communities with Dan, Mark, and their colleague, Daniel Schaepner, on June 25th. So look for that in your email inbox and at smartgrowth.org for details on this and other future webinars. Have a great day.